Good evening and a warm welcome to BIC Streams in collaboration with the International Center for Theoretical Sciences at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and the Bangalore Life Sciences Cluster at the National Center for Biological Sciences. Uh, we are very pleased to have had the world premiere of Cyclotron on BIC Films. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's discussion with the filmmaker and historian of science, Janvi Falke, and theoretical physicist, Shiraz Minwala. Before I hand over to our panelists, you can sign up to our mailing list or follow us on our social media channels for updates from us. We will share the bios of today's panelists on the chat box that you see at the bottom of your screen. Next to the chat box is the Q&A box. Please do post and type in your questions in the Q&A box. Over to you, Janvi and Shiraz. Thank you very much, Raghu. Um, so thank you very much to BIC for premiering my film, which has been ready for over a year, but I somehow never found the time to actually organize a screening. So I'm grateful to them for having kept up with it and finally making sure that I screen the film. Um, thank you also to ICTS and NCBS uh, and BLISC for agreeing to partner on this screening. And finally, thank you very much, Shiraz, for agreeing to talk to me about this film. And uh, I look forward to our conversation this evening. I just wanted to start out by saying a few words about myself and why I ended up making this film at all. Uh, so for those of you who do not know me, uh, I'm a historian of science by training. And uh, my first major work was on the beginnings of experimental nuclear physics in India, for which I studied six Indian laboratories that were trying to uh, set up experimental nuclear physics facilities beginning in the 19, late 1930s um, up until 1960. So of course the, the effort went on much after that, but this was the period I studied because this was, this was um, very early on and uh, very much in sync with you know, everyone else in the world trying to establish experimental nuclear physics facilities, uh, particularly particle accelerators. Um, and I studied six labs because uh, for those of you who might know anything about you know, uh, history of science in India, particularly of the 20th century, you will recognize that there are very few sort of institutional or, or personal archives available to write these stories. And so I simply wasn't sure that I was going to have enough, you know, uh, historical documentation to be able to write this history in a robust manner, in a, in a, in a manner that would be acceptable to my peers and my, my community. And uh, I was lucky enough that wh while I was doing my research, the TIFR, uh, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and the Indian Institute of Science Archives opened up, allowing me in-depth research into the first two labs, the third was Calcutta. So I ended up writing my, my, my dissertation and later my first book uh, based on those three labs. And those were the first three labs that tried to set up particle accelerators in India. So at the end of it, I was left with research on three labs. Um, as good academics do, um, and if I was good, I would have written three papers or, you know, written another book, which would be about the American decade of Indian nuclear research. Uh, I, sorry, uh, about Indian experimental nuclear physics research. Um, I ended up not doing that and I sat on it for a while um, and eventually at some point when I decided to venture into filmmaking, I thought I could pick up one of the stories of one of the labs and um, make a film instead. So I, I set out on this journey to make a film thinking that somehow it would be, it would certainly be better and about that I still have no doubt but that somehow it would be all right to make a film as a historian who was never quite properly trained to make one. Um, to cut a long story short, it took me six and a half years from filming to sort of being in a position to be able to show it um, to everyone. So here we are, uh, the film is out there. Uh, it is a story that's very close to my heart. I, I don't think it is a story I could have ever written doing the same kind of justice I was able to do um, to the to the absolutely wonderful people that I met when I was researching the lab, um, their efforts and and um, everything that they did, uh, I don't think my writing would match up to what the film allows me to do, which is to tell the story in the words of the people who are responsible for 
the rebuilding of the cyclotron in Chandigarh and keeping it running for over 50 years. So the film is here. It's it's for all of us to see. I, I felt a strange sense of relief after putting it out into the world. Uh, if I if I do with it the same thing that I did with my book, then I'm I'm likely to disown it in a few few months maybe, but hopefully we won't quite get there. Um, so let me just so having told you the story of how it briefly told you the story of how it actually came about without telling you uh, sort of you know the the trials and travails of actually trying to uh, do it, um, I'll I'll probably let um, let the conversation with Shiraz begin and and the, and the sort of you know the the my bumbling into making making this film come out as as the story evolves. So Shiraz, uh, again, thank you very much for agreeing to, to to a discussion. If I were to sort of begin this conversation with you by saying, okay, but, you know, what is what is it that sort of struck you most when you saw the film, and and you know, what is it that you feel we should talk about most? Well, what we should talk about is it's up to you. This is your show, <laughs> but I'll tell you what struck me most. Um, or when I when uh, uh, when I was watching this movie, the the central you know the central impression that I carried away, uh, the central feeling I carried away with me uh, after watching it was uh, uh, about how this incredible effort that the two or three main protagonists in your film, Dr. Hans and Dr. Goebel, there uh, there uh, the, the difference made by these two people. Uh, to so many people and to so much, just coming from their own passion um, and uh, their own passion to do something. In this case, something that was humanly achievable. You know, what they, what they did was to unassemble a cyclotron that was already made and reassemble it in Chandigarh. And that was a great accomplishment, but it didn't require, you know, a burst of new human knowledge or something. It's something that was within the capacity of ordinary people, or maybe extraordinary people, but with, without without some new breakthrough in human knowledge to do. Yet, it wasn't easy to do. It took a great deal of passion and you know dedication, and they did it. They made this their life, and this had such a large impact on so many people and even a little subculture of physics in in India. Uh, it felt like a very heartwarming story to me. The difference people can make if they just try, and you know they put their life in it. Yeah, because it reminds me of you know my very early conversations with uh, with with the engineers and the technicians, especially who who worked in Chandigarh, and uh, them telling me, and you know we've included a little bit of that in the film, um, with, with you know that they had never seen a cyclotron in their life. And they'd certainly not seen a working cyclotron in their life. And so they did not quite know how all of this would fit together. And uh, the, the shot that I left in is where Gulzar Singh says, you know, he took a book from the library and the book is still with him. And so that, would, that would have been about 45 years after the cyclotron came. And I you know, I mean, so the, so the kind of things they did in order to, you know, even uh, as you said, you know, it, it, it was about reassembling. But I mean, you know, uh, when I think of it, you know, the, the, intricate wiring and you know all of all of that to kind of bring it together and reassemble it was completely crazy yeah incredible and incredible they pulled it off and after so many years right i mean it wasn't a, it required years of sustained effort yeah to get it to work yeah and then continued effort to keep it running and it's incredible they pulled it off and what a difference that made it does. It does. So I think the, the 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 difference that this made. I mean, apart from the lives of the people involved in it, uh, whose stories we heard, and you know, we also understood to some extent what difference it made to their lives and careers, of course, uh, including those who made it to to BARC or to uh, to the Bhava Atomic Research Center or the Nuclear Science Center, etc. So people who trained in Chandigarh, which you know, which is essentially what uh, for the first few decades. The function that was served by the cyclotron is to train people in order for them to be able to then work with you know larger machines or other facilities elsewhere. So I think it made a difference to the people who worked there. It made a difference to the people who trained there. But also, what was remarkable, I think, is also the difference it made to the to the lives of the people around Chandigarh. Right, like it became a northern Indian facility. So before the nuclear science center, 
it it was sort of you know the primary northern indian facility and uh, they would talk talk about you know people who came there from amritsar from patiala from shimla from uh, alabad um, and you know uh, uh, use the facility for their research so it it became a, a research facility for um, regional universities in northern india and i think that for me was you know in in many ways um an accomplishment which you know uh, which is commendable uh especially given that you know uh, outside of the department of atomic energy facilities there there wasn't there wasn't much room for um doing this kind of work anywhere or anywhere to go more or less right to do do this uh, to do this kind of research so this i mean you know and of course you 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 sit at tfr which is you know uh, of course where one of one of the first three labs that i studied and you know also one of the first uh, one of the first three um where uh, experimental nuclear physics even even took roots in india so after calcutta it was pretty much uh, bombay uh, but you know the the resources available in these institutions were of course far far larger uh, far larger than uh, the kind of resources that were available to a regional university like punjab university and so i think that also makes this accomplishment quite uh, quite commendable and to have i mean going back to you know one of the things that surprise me again and again the in many ways the audacity right to to sort of go to rochester and say i want to take this machine home right and that i'm going to find a job and i am going to set this machine up in a university and i'm going to do experimental nuclear physics right because this is this is you know th this is in 1967 it's of course after atoms for peace but in 1967 um to say that you know you will yeah you will you will set up a set up a an experimental sort of apparatus outside of the dae without in in a, in a project that is not initiated by the department of atomic energy or the government of india or the university grants commission and without so, yourself being a total expert on the subject right precisely that is incredible i mean what confidence it must have been. exactly right yeah i mean i think it that's sort of you know um yeah it, it's 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 uh, it's commendable there's a certain passion right i mean your your two main protagonists seem to have made this their life's mission and it's incredible true true so i think you know when when i look at professor hans's story right i mean it is it is very much you know it's his baby it's his project there's no doubt i mean everyone in chandigarh will tell you that and the story also comes through uh in his interviews uh it's not unlike you know how the other three labs in india the the first three labs that i spoke about also started out it had a mentor and a mentee and then you know different ways in which um, these labs came together so in the case of calcutta it was meghnath saha who mentored bd nak pasant uh, sidulal nak choudhury or bd nak choudhury as he is known to uh, many of us he mentored him and uh, you know so he sent pd nak choudhury just before the outbreak of the second world war to berkeley to learn with ernest lawrence and come back and set up a particle accelerator facility in calcutta and in bangalore it was c v raman uh, who sent uh, rs krishnan a mentee of his a student of his to the cavendish to learn how to maintain and repair and build a cyclotron and come back to india and set up one and uh, i think that the tifr story is of course slightly different uh, also because i mean unlike um, unlike uh, raman and meghnath saha who were both not nuclear physicists but uh, wanted nuclear physics to be established in india because that's where the field was going that's you know that's what physicists or that's what a good physics institution or a good physics department should do and therefore they wanted that for their departments uh um, in the case of baba he himself was a cosmic ray physicist so in, in a way it's it's his own discipline that stood at the threshold of nuclear physics right and so he in a way he was the mentor and the people he mentored were you know uh, a small team and and there was great struggle between between eventually the fusion people and the particle accelerator people uh, but it was it was fadke dy fadke uh, for those of you who might know him from tifr who you know um, uh, baba in a way uh, pulled into the process of having a particle accelerator at uh, uh, at tifr uh, eventually in bombay and so so the story in a way you know it it it's it repeats itself that there is a mentor who who recognizes that this is essential for a good self respecting physics department to have 
and to give proper training to people and then they have they work with their with their mentees who's and, and it becomes their life's passion and you know those departments get established so i wonder what it is uh, what, what it is about uh, or if this story repeats elsewhere i mean i i i, I wouldn't know i mean uh, i haven't studied other experimental uh, disciplines in to the same extent to know um uh, what you know what what the stories are there but hans i mean you know uh, professor hans uh, is a very very interesting figure i mean and i i absolutely um, my favorite story of course of all and you know i mean in the long interview he of course spoke about uh, partition and the move of his family from uh, uh, from what is today pakistan to uh, india and he was teaching at banaras hindu university at that point of time so he speaks at length about that move from uh, mogga uh, and uh, you know uh, and later moving from there uh, having done his schooling there uh, eventually to bhu where he was um, at the time of independence and partition and he he's he spoke at great length about uh, about that as well and I, i i cherish those moments but i think my favorite story still remains the one that i then eventually included in the film about him locking his wife <laughs> You know what I found really funny about that story was that he at the end of the story he said uh, you asked uh, uh, ask him was your was your wife angry and he says no I don't think she was angry she may have been a bit sad but not angry and the wife says I was furious <laughs> I mean how did he not pick that up <laughs> yes. yes indeed I mean I, yes Mrs Hans was was lovely I mean you know I I had the I had the privilege of meeting her when when we when we did the interviews because I interviewed. Professor Hans also at home. He was, you know, he was aging then. Also, we unfortunately is no longer with us, uh, and so I visited them at home, and she was most generous about, you know, her own impressions of that of that journey, of what it meant to be, uh, as Professor Hans himself admits, you know, to be neglected pretty much because it was Professor Hans's dream to have what is today the Inter University Accelerator Center, which sits in Delhi, um, in Chandigarh, right? and so he he basically was the not in not not india's particle accelerator person i mean he wanted that facility uh, and had it not uh, well not had it not and had it not i mean as a historian of course i don't work with counterfactuals at least not comfortably but um, uh, well i mean documentation shows us and uh, the stories that people there told me uh, as well is that uh, it's because of uh, the tensions in punjab at that moment um that the facility was not established in chandigarh but instead sent to delhi and i think that was a that probably was a setback for him personally as as well as for the team um to not to not have uh, in a way you know because that was the that was the goal right like that was the how do you how do you say it in, I, i forget it now but as in the us that it that was the prize i guess yes that's what one says yes because that was the prize right like uh, to have the inter university accelerator center being established in chandigarh um and i wonder i mean I, i the last i i spoke to them which was still a few years ago uh, they still um were working quite hard on getting a bigger machine to chandigarh um and hopefully you know once the pandemic is sort of behind us i might go and show the film and talk to people and find out what's actually happening there but uh yeah so you know as a physicist what is it that that sort of strikes you as interesting about this film if one were to think about it in the context of research and higher higher education in india well there are so many things uh but uh, the first thing that strikes you is what a what a, what a role the accelerator seems to have played in training uh, mm. that strikes struck me is what a role the accelerator seems to have played in training so many students um I don't know this personally, but from the film, I got got the feeling that uh, the accelerator must have produced many tens, perhaps hundreds of PhDs, and uh, uh, and uh, you give the sense that uh, in the Inter University Accelerator Center in Delhi, there's a large presence of people from from Chandigarh because of because of the training they received in the cyclotron. So uh, it uh, seems amazing to me. I mean, it seems not amazing. It seems. Uh, it's instructive to me how uh, a cyclotron facility that is probably far from state of the art mm-hmm. can still play such a major role in uh, in in training and then sort of 
facilitating the building of a research atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I, I yes, I mean, I, I would agree. And, you know, uh, uh, the it's a it's a small machine. I mean, you know, it, it's it, it even when it came to India, uh, it was very clear that, you know, you there was there were limits to how much basic research you could actually do with a machine of that kind. Right. Because I mean, it's it's from it's from 1936. Right. It's it's right. It, it had gone critical in 1936 uh, at the University of Rochester. And uh, it was built, incidentally, by Sidney Barnes and Lee Dubridge. Lee Dubridge, who, you know, uh, well, 10 years after building this cyclotron, was at the radiation laboratory at MIT during the war for about six years, so I think 1940 to 46, following which he was the president of Caltech for 20 years, uh, I think 49 to 69. And, uh, you know, so... It, you know, so it, it was an interesting machine and also it was built very much, you know, within three years, within three years of uh, Lawrence's first, um, I mean, no, historians of technology uh, are loath to use the word invention, but within prove the cyclotron principle, the working of a cyclotron principle, right? Like, I mean, his was working in 33, in 36, you have this one, which is, so if I'm not, if I'm not entirely mistaken, uh, my research tells me that this was the third at most the fourth cyclotron ever to be built right and which is what makes it the world's oldest functioning cyclotron today i mean i'm happy to be proved wrong but i don't think i am uh, so it you know it, it's so it's it's an extraordinary historically extraordinary machine for that reason right and uh, so it's it's so it's a, Historically, if one looks at it, I mean, you know, there are so many threads that it weaves together so, and so many legacies that it weaves together uh, internationally, but also, you know, for within India. And I, and I tried to bring some of that, some of that context by, you know, by bringing a little bit of Lawrence, bringing a little bit of Atom Sufis into the film. But it's, um, but at the end of the day, I mean, if you ask me, you know, in a single line, you know, what would I say the film is about? And I don't think I, I, I will... I will hush, hush up and dive. I mean, I won't hesitate to repeat what I have said in the description of the film itself, which is that for me, it's about the people who keep it running, right? The film is really about uh, about the people rather than uh, rather than anything else. And I think the extraordinariness of the machine allows me to tell allows me to tell that story. So it's it's uh, you know uh, so allow me to also ask you one more question about you know so so we we understand that it's training its role in in training people we understand its role sort of you know in in a sense historically is there anything else you felt that you could take away from um from the yeah from the film that struck you yeah, I, I, as i said at the beginning you know my, i i i felt that the most remarkable element of the film as you say is the effect of some people's effort, how much effect that had. But I wanted to ask you a question, a sort of a, sort of a question. Um, was there any, uh, what was the, was there a collab, you know, uh, when they were setting up the cyclotron, you said that they got somebody from, uh, from the UK to help them get the beam yes. out of the machine. Yes. Uh, I was wondering at that point whether there were, whether they had similar collaborative efforts with institutes in India, especially with GIFR. I found no mention of Indian uh, yeah. collaboration with uh, Chandig, you know, let's say TIFR collaboration with Chandig or BARC. I was wondering about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's a good question. Very good question. I mean, I asked them. I don't think I got any conclusive answers to that. I mean, the Birmingham. Uh, so, um, Mr. Powell, who came, he was a lab. I mean, he was a he was a cyclotron technician, right? Like a very very qualified technician. And and the primary reason for getting him was because. They were getting an internal beam and they weren't getting an external beam, right? They weren't able to extract a beam. And so he came over and he helped them do that because Birmingham had a similar-ish cyclotron at that point of time. So it wasn't really in that sense of collaboration, but it was really, uh, well, it was, how should one put it? Um, they were helping us, right? They were helping, exactly. So, I mean, or, or Mr. Powell was helping, uh, helping people yeah. there. Um, in terms of, you know, uh, in terms of collaboration, my first question to them was, of course, about Calcutta, right? Like Calcutta has India's oldest cyclotron, which they started building in the late 40s and finished, I think, in the late 40s. Um, because, I mean, this is because of the, the Second World War, uh, you know, 
the parts were being shipped from the United States and reaching Calcutta. Uh, one particular shipment was sunk by uh, Japanese torpedoes and, you know, a very interesting story there too. But, th but that, uh, that is India's oldest cyclotron. So when, you know, so when my question was, okay, why didn't anybody reach out to the people in Calcutta? Why did, you know, a relationship not build between Calcutta and, um, Calcutta and uh, Nandigarh? Yeah. And when they were having trouble, let's say, getting the beam out of the machine, why, why didn't somebody from Calcutta come over to? to Precisely. Calcutta? And, and, and there were people, I mean, you know, there were people who were no to be, to put, right? Yeah. Like, so I, I, frankly, I did not get a conclusive answer. I mean, and these kinds of answers, of course, are never found with documentation, but are found with people. Uh, but I did not get a conclusive answer to that question at all. But this is, I mean, this is something that I've come across. So, you know, since, since uh, sort of, you know, getting obsessed with experimental nuclear physics, I've sort of branched out a little bit and also tried to look at the history of aerodynamics and uh, statistics in India. And I have to say from the little that I've done, this seems to be true of very many facilities and institutions in India that the collaborations externally, as in external to India, are stronger and no, and numerous as compared to the collaborations, if at all, within India. I think we did. We need to look into this. I mean, probably more carefully look at look into it statistically first. Of, first, you know, it, it's true at all, and to what extent it's true, and and you know, why that is the case. I mean, we, it's it's um, yeah, it's it's simply there. What, what do you what do you think? Why why do you think that happens? I I, I have no clue actually. Um... You know, my, I, I myself am a theoretical physicist, and it may be a bit different there, but sure. perhaps you suggest it's not, when you were saying uh, you found some similar trends in when you were looking at statistics. Statistics as well, absolutely. Yes, I yes. do. Uh, let's see. In my own field, would I say that we are, that we collaborate more easily outside than inside the country? I don't think so, but I would have to think harder about it. It is sometimes true that you tend to meet your colleagues from Allahabad more frequently outside the country than inside the country. You know, at conferences that you, I mean, this is in the era when we went to conferences. Of course, of course. <laughs> which will come back, which will come back. I'm still hopeful. I'm yes. Still okay. hopeful. yes. Uh, yeah. but, but I don't know. It's a, it's a great question and I, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. No, I wonder. I mean, I, I do. Yeah. I don't, I, somehow in my community, I don't think it's true. You know, for hmm. instance, between Mumbai and Bangalore, I'm a string theorist, and there are many active string theory groups all over the country, and we have very active interaction between these. I mean, groups. beyond ICTS? Beyond ICTS as well, but ICTS and, and Mumbai interact really very much. I mean, you know, it's TIFR anyway. It's TIFR anyway. But let's say with IISC, Bangalore, with, with institutions sure. in Madras, or, uh, people yeah. at the ICERs or the IITs, just all over the country, we somehow interact quite a lot. Perhaps even more now since this pandemic. Yeah. ICER, ICER, um, uh, ICER Pune, uh, yeah. there's a lot of interaction with Twitter. So maybe, maybe things are changing. Yeah. Maybe things are changing. I don't know. I mean, historically, I've, I've seen, I've seen less of it. I have to say. Yeah. Yeah. Desire yeah. to come together and work together. Yeah. Um, or maybe even, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe there's other things at play. Maybe it's resources, maybe, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, this is something I say often to colleagues, which is that um, Karnataka is the size of France and Maharashtra is the size of Germany. I mean, you know, and that's just the start of an argument, right? Like if you, if you look at the number of universities in Paris alone or the number of institutions in Paris alone, and then of course extended to the rest of France, we have nowhere close to the number uh, of institutions required, you know, for the kind of a vibrant scientific community one, one would like to see emerge um, and is totally possible in this country. I think it's, it's beginning to happen, but I don't think we're quite there yet. I mean, this is my sort of, you know, very general um, eagle eye view assessment of it. And, you know, I'm ready to be butchered for it and also ready to be proved wrong. Um, but, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's uh, it's sobering when you when you sort of do that comparison, right? And and then you know once you, but but also working at the reverse end of that argument, then the uh, collaboration say between between an institution in France and Germany not happening doesn't seem to be 
or not happening to the same extent as we would want to doesn't seem to be a complete surprise because you know the, the scale is large and one would expect there are many more people around you uh, to allow for that collaboration to happen but of course that's actually not the case so it's it's uh, it's it's interesting but i think it does need to be explored and that actually does touch on you know what we started talking about uh, the state of higher education and research uh, research in india and what might actually uh, what might actually be done usefully to to recognize um recognize the challenges right like almost sisyphean challenges that uh, that that um, scholars in regional universities confront when they try to establish state of the art facilities right or uh, i mean it, um, resources i mean you know they're just so under resourced that one doesn't know where to where to even begin to talk about it and i think that that would be something worth worth exploring um, more seriously uh, and and you know and extrapolating from this one case to see uh, see see what's there or what needs what needs to happen um, i mean uh, for me as a historian of science one lesson of course that you know it's a lesson for me but i think it's something that i'd like all of us to take note of is that we don't know enough about our own stories right we don't know we don't know enough of what's going on we don't tell ourselves proper stories and you know and by proper stories i mean proper histories of science um not not just stories right like not not um uh, uh not something that's done sort of you know in a piece and then forgotten about but actually taking it seriously uh studying it um with the with the with the respect and the and the scholarly attention that it deserves in order to be in order to be able to even tell ourselves what it is that's actually true right about the state of uh, state of education and research in india and i think because you know decisions in the past have both consequences as well as residues right and uh, i mean the residues need to be kind of you know isolated and found and the consequences of course i mean are, are there and but we can't just say this is a consequence of decisions taken in the past and then you know kind of move on but but because they come with costs they come with costs and those need to be need to be understood far better i think uh, than we do at the moment so i think for me as a historian of science it's it the one message i'd really like to share with uh, with pretty much anyone who's interested in the film is that you know we need i mean this is one story in a country that massive <laughs> we need more of this right like much more of this uh, yeah along these lines i was wondering i wondering as you say this is one story that i personally had never heard of um you know yeah. i heard of the players in some some sense but i i didn't know of the story the, the, this incredible story yeah. where uh, as you hinted there must be a hundred such stories within india yes have you have you through your um through your journey come across other stories with which struck you like this one did i'm sure you have but i mean other other many other many such stories of great individual accomplishment that have had huge impact you have come across right uh, so just, in your experience yeah 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 so i think um i have i have so you know i mean in in the in the two or three areas that i have done more research than i have just sort of you know cursorily looked at um i mean even within nuclear physics okay i mean even even within experimental nuclear physics that you know there's a, there's the story of um uh andhra university voltaire right it was in the 1950s and 60s a leading department of nuclear physics in the country with i think 14 or 15 people uh employed i mean 14 or 15 nuclear physics nuclear physicists and then others employed in the department and if i'm and it was led by this very interesting figure called swami gyanananda who was a freedom fighter a sanyasi and who escaped india because of you know uh, charges of sedition and then i think if i remember correctly uh he went first went to berlin as most people did and then went to michigan and then got a degree in nuclear physics and then came back and at some point someone told me he was also gifted in gifted a gifted a, a small particle accelerator wow i don't know the source of it so one person told me it was from mit but i'm not entirely sure it was i did try but not yeah. but not hard enough to was that one set up it was it was it was most certainly i i'm not sure the source of it but it was most certainly set up so you know so there's that story 
uh, which is you know waiting to be written there's also waiting to be written and and or shown or whatever you know properly there is also the story of uh, the very first effort i mean before chandigarh it was aligarh muslim university where they i mean in in defiance of the tata institute of fundamental research and the department of atomic energy it was professor piara singh gill who um, for various reasons fell out with homi jahangir baba and uh, then went to aligarh and set up uh, he, he was he was the person who got hans his job at kurukshetra is that right yes he was the one who got him the job it, yes. exactly exactly and so he um, they set up a cockroach fault um so so you know again a small particle accelerator in aligarh so there's that story uh, you know the story shows up a little bit in my film but it doesn't show up fully because you know uh, it's it's uh, uh i think that story needs to be written or at least told about um so so you know so so yeah so there's 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 that there's the ali uh, the sorry the andra story um in in uh, uh i mean aerodynamics and aeronautics oh well oh no when even even if you look at uh, the other story and that i did write about is which is rs krishnan um from bangalore a student of ramans who went to the cavendish during the second world war cavendish uh, at the university of cambridge and as most of us are aware it was a second world war so most of the physics department was actually in war effort and many of them had gone to chalk river in canada and uh, to london or various part parts of england to work on you know what was called tube alloys and basically the bomb program um and the radar program and rs krishnan kept the cambridge cyclotron running during the war years he was responsible for the cyclotron running during the war year so he so his there are beautiful reference letters written for him by uh, john de cockcroft saying you know he well he won he discovered some nine isotopes uh, in uh, in his work on the cyclotron during the war uh, but that he you know he ran it and he knew how to keep it uh, sort of you know repair it he knew how to do everything with it and uh, i mean including losing grad students in air bombings and things like that right like so i mean it's it's, it's quite an incredible story uh, the rs krishnan story as well i mean he came back to india and then never did nuclear physics again hmm. uh, and you know uh, that's a tragedy but also an interesting story um, for those of you who are interested you'll find it in the book um so so there's there are those stories and you know i mean even in statistics i mean yes malanobis is a big name it's not an unknown name but even so i think how many of us today know Uh, you know we talk about data we talk about big data we talk about sampling we talk about all um you know we talk about many such things but i i think what we've forgotten is that you know at the end of the second world war with you know uh, uh republican china and india kind of trying to create new identities in the world um one sort of you know self claimed communist state one sort of you know centrist or slightly left of center um and non aligned state Uh, at a distance from the soviet union but also at a distance from the united states but they take different modes right a, for governance i mean they have to they have to govern these large land, land masses as modern nation states that have come into being at the end of the second world war and china's answer is 100% um census right so for data gathering in order to understand everything from agriculture to industrial production to family to you know birth rate to whatever is 100% census India's answer is random sampling. So random sampling was a solution to scale for creating a governing system, right? And it it, it was I mean at at that in the first about 20 years of independence the Indians were ahead of the rest of the world in terms of statistical techniques of on sampling and everybody including the Chinese came to India for training. Right? So there were two places you could train in and one was in cairo and one was in in calcutta so you know these are these are sort of you know and then and then and there are there are yeah i mean then there are stories in every mix and mix yes so so there are many 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 such stories and they need to be they need to be told oh, one more question you know most of these stories that you have referred to um happened seem to have happened your in 1950s or 60s yes uh are there more modern such stories Oh, modern day stories. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a. What about things that happened in the last twenty years? Have you come? Uh, or, or was that just a special time? Was it just a? So very, very good question. Uh, my safe answer would be to say I'm a historian of twentieth century India, and you know, 
uh, and therefore, no, I haven't, I, I don't think I've looked enough in the last 20 years, right? Or for the last 20 years. Um, I mean, one is of course, simple archive, archival rules, wherever archives are available, they're open for the last, they're, they're open for like, the, the, you know, the third, there's a 30 year gap, right? Like, so you can't see papers for the previous 30 years, you can see everything before that. So part of it is that. Uh, but the but the other uh, part of it is also that I haven't I haven't looked and I'm pretty sure there must be story. I mean, th there's the story of the flow solver that I think many of you might know, right? When the Indians were denied uh, supercomputing facilities uh, and access to the prey, uh, Professor Radham Narasimha, um, you know, he led people at the National Aeronautics uh, or Aerospace Laboratories to create flow solver in India, right? So. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm absolutely certain, but you know, you, you, you need an army, you need a community, you need a professional community of historians of science and technology to be able to do this work, right? Because it's not simply about finding these stories and writing little pieces, as I said, but actually you need to do the kind of um, historical work that would do justice to those stories uh, in all its consequences, right? Well, um, should we probably let yeah. uh, the audience ask us questions as well? Yeah, we have uh, lots of uh, questions, Janvi. So uh, I, I just have, a, uh, okay, let me start out. Yeah, just start out, Prabhu, in the order okay. that you like. Yeah, okay. So uh, this is a question from Indu. So shifting the conversation a little bit to the filmmaking process itself. Uh, yeah. uh, Indu says, congratulations on making such a wonderful and warm uh, and in some ways quirky film. Uh, she's curious about the filmmaking process. Uh, at which point did you decide to focus on the film uh, would be the people behind the rebuilding and maintaining of the cyclotron and why uh, you chose this facility over the other four? Okay. Over the other five, yes. Um, yeah. So, um, at which point did I decide it's about the people? I think it was... Um, how should I begin? I, sh I think I should begin with a confession. I went and I went and filmed like a historian, right? So I went and filmed words and words and more words. Uh, you're going to be quite surprised to probably learn. I mean, Indu, I know you're a filmmaker. I came with little, next to little or no B-roll. So basically I came back with words as historians do. So I came back with loads of interviews, which, and so the film was always, in my mind, it wasn't a choice. It was always, I mean, it, it was, what else could it have been about? I don't think I even gave thought to it becoming about anything else, right? It was it was always about the people. And I think, and I'm, I'm absolutely delighted that you actually asked about the, the filmmaking process because this is something, um, I'm, uh, I don't even know how to, you know, I think it was Goda who said once that films get made at the editing table you know, rarely in the filming of it. And I think it's even more true about this film than um, uh, anyone that I've ever seen my friends make or anyone that I ever will make. So I, I uh, um, you know, I went and filmed like a historian, as I said, I came back with, with lots of words and I came back with lots of talking heads. Um, and I was looking for editors who would work with me. I was looking for an editor who would work with me to make the film. And the first person I went to told me I had no film and that I should make an installation, a circular installation with six screens and have six interviews running on, on, on them in loop. And that would make for an interesting installation. I was, I was stunned, I was disappointed. And I, and I sort of you know started looking for, um, Another, uh, another person. And then and the story was similar with the other two. Uh, they wanted me to do paper edits, which I had no clue how it was done, um, et cetera. And it was through serendipity that I, that I met Tanya Singh, who's the editor of the film. Um, she was doing a film festival at King's College London, which is where I was um, uh, teaching. And I asked her if she knew someone who would work with me. And she said, oh, I could try. And she took the footage with her. She watched it. As it turned out, she was actually born on that campus. She did not know that when she took the footage home. Uh, she left with her parents to go to England, I think when she was three or something like that. Very, very small or very, very young, sorry. And uh, so she knew the three languages in the film. 
the Punjabi, the Hindi, and the English, which meant she actually got the nuances of what was being spoken. And uh, quite frankly, I don't think this film would have been possible without her. I mean, not only because she worked with me really, really hard to understand what it is that I was trying to say through the film, but also I think went far, so, sort of went beyond what one would call Call of, du call of Duty. And uh, she was in India for, her, for, for preparations for her own wedding, in fact. She went to the lab, she went and met the people in, in the film, she talked to them, she got back some more stills and some more footage. Um, and, you know, so, so her involvement in the film was, was indeed extremely crucial. And she also, to some extent, if I, I mean, if, if she's here, she might actually speak for herself. Um, and, I, I, and I'd love it, uh, uh, Tanya, if you're around to make yourself seen and, and say a few words because I think she also began to in many ways care for uh, the people we had filmed in similar ways to which I cared for the story and the people in it and I think that made for a, 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 a good partnership which made the which made the film what it is uh, and uh, as to why I chose this one over the others I think I'd written about about the first three and the protagonists in the first three were long gone by the time I came to making the film. I mean, Homi Baba died in 1966. That was before I was even born. Um, or Raman or others. Uh, so one thing is this, you know, I had met the people in this lab. I knew them. I had, I had built a rapport with them. And it was an extraordinary machine. I mean, it, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful machine. Um, so in a way, it seemed obvious. So, so, you know, once the ones in the book were taken care of, there were, there were two others that I could have chosen from. One was Kanpur, um, the Fundograph in Kanpur and uh, the Chandigarh story. But I, I mean, I, I don't think that even occurred to me that I could, could have made a film about any other. It, the, the, I think the warmth with which I was welcomed in Chandigarh, um, the, the, the way in which, you know, uh, I saw the care for the machine uh, among the people told me that this was, this was larger than an academic story to be written. And so I think it presented itself as a, as a, as a, um, you know, the, the film was, the, was, film seemed to be the right form to show this film. So, uh, so sorry, to, to tell this story. So, uh, Janvi, we have uh, D.P. Singh, who's a former student of uh, Professor H.S. Hans okay. and uh, Professor Hans' son, Vikram Hans, who's yes. jo who has joined us uh, today. Uh, okay. So, uh, uh, I'm going to go uh, to uh, one question to you now and then a uh, question to Shiraz. Uh, there are two questions, actually a lot of questions about the labor of love that the cyclotron and maintaining it was. So uh, this is a question from Prem Chandavakar. Has there been any study that examines the role emotions play in the development of science uh, combined with uh, a similar question from Xavier Roque. Um, as a histori historian of science, um, I'm not, I'm stuck by the amount of labor involved. Instruments are hard and banal histories of science tend to dismiss or downplay this labor. Um, so um, I wonder, Janvi, if there is something you had in mind when you began film, the idea that you can do science at a relatively small human scale, uh, even in a field like nuclear physics. Yeah, thank you. So it's, thank you, Javier. It's really nice to have you here. And uh, I'm, I, I, I guess the question, uh, comes from your own work in, uh, uh, you know, how small science survives, actually, and big science hasn't really taken over um, in ways in which we, we think it has. You're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think, you know, and, and Prem, thank you for the question, too, because, uh, like, like I said in my answer to Indu's question, um, it's, you know, I, I, I did not feel, and, and Javier used a good word, uh, banal, right? I did not feel that my, my the form that my profession first, which is papers and books, had the capacity to bring out the, bring out what doing this work meant for the people who were involved in it, right? I did not think I was capable, as I said at the start, I mean, neither my language nor the form that my profession allows me um, had the capacity to bring out this very, I mean, it, it very strong emotional aspect of the story. Uh, and, and it, you know, it, this, is, this is extremely hard work. 
uh, as Chiraz rightly pointed out, it's not a breakthrough in that sense, but it's it's hard work. I mean, you know, getting the right vacuum, getting it to work. I mean, until they uh, got solid state uh, power supply, the, you know, getting the vacuum at the right um, uh, at the right value and maintaining it over a day, making the thing run, you know, is extremely hard work. And you know, they weren't necessarily trained to do these things. And to the dedication, the care the care for the machine, the care for each other, and doing it at a scale which was different to everything that was happening around them with a sense of mission, which was almost, which was very aware, which was very aware of the large shadow of big physics, right? Of particle physics, of CERN, for example. I mean, and they do talk about CERN, how, how money, you know, in a sense, or funding, research funding, is largely poured into collaborative teams that go to CERN or KEK or you know DESI or wherever else that is uh, they they go. Uh, so in that awareness, but still not losing sight of what is valuable about this machine to themselves and their lives and the lives of those around them, I just felt you know that this uh, and you know I mean it's yeah it 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 presented itself. I think that this was this was the only way I could have told that story. And I'm going to try. In fact, I'm going to try to write a paper about it. Um, so, uh, Javier, to your question, I am going to try to write a paper. And I'm going to see how it actually comes out and how much of this, you know, I, I can do any justice to when I when I write about it. But but uh, uh, in conclusion, absolutely. I mean, you know, a small physics or small science never quite died, right? I mean, big physics is talked about. Small small science is or big science is talked about. Small science is not talked about. But there are those stories waiting to be written. And we need to write them, and you know, happy to do that. Absolutely happy to do that. Uh, this is a question to um, Shiraz from Mukund uh, There is a point where Professor Hans talks about the hierarchy of theory over experiments in India. Another person mentions during uh, integration versus working with your hands. This attitude is still pervasive. How much had this held back physics in India? In biology, things are more well balanced. Experiments drive the field. We theorists run behind. Okay, so it's a, it's a good question, and I'm sort of a bit, uh, you know, it's it's the question about uh, generalizations, and I'm going to give a view that is probably very uninformed, and will probably get some of my colleagues angry. But uh, I, I think there's truth to what both to the to this view. Um, when I was a student, I was a student at IIT Kanpur. And um, uh, I was not. A, I was a theoretical physicist, but most of my colleagues were engineers. Most of my my fellow students were engineers. There were 300 of us in a batch. Maybe 20 of us were pure scientists. The rest were all engineers. And we used to have these courses on welding and uh, you know machine making and so on, where we would actually go and use a lathe machine and try to make stuff. And I totally hated it, of course, as did every self-respecting theorist. But what surprised me was that many of the engineers also just hated it. Many of the engineers just wanted to wanted to be in their their rooms and uh, um, calculating and letting somebody else do the lathe work. Um, mm. That sort of struck me, uh, and I think that it does have something to do with my personal feeling, which I'm, I cannot back up. But it is that it does have something to do with what the protagonists in the film mentioned that there is this uh, sort of. Uh, hierarchy about what, what is the most uh, cerebral thing, which some people think of as theory, and maybe even within theory, what is the most cerebral kind of theory? Um, many, many Indian students, or some Indian students, sort of grow up a little bit with, with a hierarchy in their mind about what is the coolest thing to do. And that's very stupid, in my opinion. You know, because doing anything very well is very valuable. There's no real hierarchy in science, as any serious scientist knows. Everything is interesting and everything is connected. And, uh, it's silly to think that this is more important than that, this is more important than that. But many Indian students, including I think myself when I was growing up, uh, came with a little bit of that view. Now, whether it's con connected with Brahminism and the caste system, as one of the protagonists in the film sort of seemed to suggest, or not, all that is beyond my, my pay grade. But uh, I think we have this to an extent that. And it's less in other countries. I think American students, my, my experience in American graduate college is that people are happier to work with their hands. And I think it's more in India. I am not so sure. I'm not, I'm not terribly sure about that. 
But I, I think there's some truth to it. And I think it does hamper Indian science. Perhaps it's less true now than it used to be. Within TIFR, I increasingly see some of our best students opting for experimental uh, disciplines, which I think, though it would be nice to do some statistics on this, but I think just from my own personal impression, have, used to happen a little less 15 years ago. So perhaps it's getting, it's changing. That's it. Uh, Janvi, would you like to comment or can we go to the next question? Uh, this is like the, it's a, it's a, it's a tough question. And I think my answer will be just as, as sort of, you know, at the, at the level of a generalization, but I, I, I think it's, it's actually true. And I think I, I'm really glad Shiraz, you pointed out the, how engineers also, right? I mean, my, my uh, so I wasted two years at IIT Bombay and uh, in, in the worst sort of state, uh, but that that's a story for later. But how even engineers, right? Like they wanted to become mathematicians, right? And they, and they, and they wanted to do the most abstract things and they did not actually want to go to labs, right? Or, or they did not want to go to use the lathes. Um, or, or milling machines or filing machines or anything of that sort. And, you know, I mean, even today, if you look at the average sort of, you know, trajectory of, of, uh, of an engineer in good institutions in India, and, you know, we're talking about engineers, we're not talking about people from the basic sciences. I mean, they, they, they do not want to go into careers which involves actually having uh, three colored pens and screwdrivers and and uh, pliers and all of that in their pocket right like i mean they, they're looking for very different kinds of careers they're looking for uh, they're looking for managerial careers they're looking for if in research they're looking for for careers where, which allows them to think so i think this this separation of mind and body or the relationship between manual work and intellectual work which is which has been drawn again and again not just in india it's been drawn elsewhere too but in india it takes a particular form right and i think uh, that has consequences. I mean, that, that does have consequences because, um, you know, uh, even good theoreticians uh, require, I mean, if you look at the careers of uh, good theoretical um, scientists, even from India, like Meghnath Saha and others, they did rely on and know how to do a good experiment, how to design a good experiment and how to set up a good experiment. But somehow we seem to, we seem to have lost or not want, we don't want to do it. We don't want to do it. And I, I mean, Professor Hans has one explanation for it. I'm sure there are others too. Um, it needs to be studied. It needs to be studied carefully, I think. Uh, so the next question uh, are by two students, actually. I'm combining two questions, one by Harsh and uh, Ushukla. Uh, how important is it to know history of um, sciences is Harsh's question. Uh, as <laughs> you know, a student of uh, physics must go out and know little about the history of even concepts while studying concepts. And Ushukla's question is, as students of physical science, we never encounter stories of science and research development in India. How do you think this could be changed, keeping in mind there needs to be enough space and time for students to invest in their academic research? Yeah, I mean, you know, students telling me that they don't have time enough to do anything other than their syllabi. I mean, you know, frankly, guys, get a life. Because, you know, I mean, I, I think, I think, we have turned our educational system collectively into an exam oriented system where course after course after course, credit after credit after credit, and you know, who finishes first, who finishes fast, who finishes whatever, right? I think, I think that, that entire sort of competitive, judgmental, evaluative system needs to be, re, you know, needs to be redone collectively. And I think it also involves students themselves because, I mean, I, I, yeah, so, so there's always time to do things uh, and one has, I mean, or rather I should say that one, one can always make time. There isn't ever time, like nobody's going to give you time. You have to make time. It is important. I think it's important to know the history of science and it's important to know things. Um, um, so look at it this way, right? Like, I mean, as students of science, I think it, it, it is incredibly important to know how your disciplines came about. Decisions taken, decisions not taken. Um, or pathways followed, pathways not followed, research abandoned, not abandoned, rather than sort of, you know, just mugging up sort of, you know, what are, what are considered facts, et cetera. But, uh, uh, and, and the other, I mean, th there are two other things that I'd like to add to this. One is the Indian, uh, Indian stories in the larger history of science. But also today, I think, even for people who study um, history or literature, or sociology or politics 
I don't think you can allow yourself to not know history of science or to not know some of these basics. Because how, I mean, let me ask just one rhetorical question. How, I mean, social scientists study contemporary times, right? Like unlike us historians who sort of, you know, uh, basically study in the dust and, and darkness of, of the past. How do, how do political scientists today imagine they can study democracy without understanding algorithms and how Cambridge Analytica came into being and functions, right? So I don't think there is getting away from any of this. And I don't think, you know, as people in the human sciences or social sciences and the humanities have the luxury of saying we don't want to understand this either, right? And the same is true also for people in the sciences. I mean, you, you know, how do you train yourself to in a way work or create algorithms or think about, you know, conce conceptual work around, the, around, you know, something like that without understanding the consequences and social implications of it. And for that, you do need to study science in its context or sci understand science in, within culture or science as a cultural activity, as a social enterprise. So I think, you know, uh, it, it's, it's an effort everybody simply just needs to make. Uh, there is no escaping that. Um, thanks, Shanvi. There are lots of questions on uh, the international networks that made such a, a project possible. So I'm combining three different questions, but um, this is from Bridget. Um, uh, is, if she asks, uh, you know, uh, one of the emphasis of how a sort of insularity, uh, you know, starting with the physics department was shared by members of the team. Is this a bias from the main, uh, main um, protagonists or do you have some uh, objective of ob uh, objectification of the feeling? Also, did the Rochester University group um, take any interest in the cyclotron that they had given, you know, and what kind of international network uh, to support the effort to rebuild a working instrument and share the results achieved once the cyclotron was working? Okay. So, uh, yeah, so I think these are like three or four questions. I'll quickly try to answer these. Uh, one is, I think the, the, the insularity that the team felt was largely from, uh, largely within the department, right? Uh, people around them, themselves, like uh, they did not quite, under, I mean, like, you know, like, like the protagonists say at some point, um, many people around us, uh, many people around us thought that this was, um, you know, an old machine and it was not going to be able to deliver what it should, um, etc. So, um, it's, uh, so, um, um, yeah, so the insularity was largely for people around them. In terms of international networks, I think they got help from um, from Professor Fulbright, who was responsible for the transfer uh, in uh, to begin with. Uh, they got also help from Birmingham. So, uh, you know, the new people in Birmingham who were working with a similar cyclotron. So, you know, there was there was a network existing um, in, in that sense of cyclotron builders. I mean, the cyclotron community is, is sort of, you know, linked into each other. Um, and you know, it also allowed for other kinds of um, uh, other kinds of international networks to emerge. So, for example, the students that uh, you know, the, the students that came from Iran, right? Uh, and those were the ones I included um, in the in the film. But also, you know, so so it, it, it international networks of you know more in the region within the region, um, and uh, others where you know who they who they collaborated with. So, so the, in, in terms of support to rebuild the equipment, yes, they had support from uh, Professor Fulbright himself, who also came down to Chandigarh and from Birmingham. And then later, uh, it built another kind of international network uh, through the research. Um, this question from Nityanand Rao. In the film, you mentioned Dr. Gill. I'm guessing this is Piara Singh Gill. Hmm. Could you talk a little bit more about him if you were able to learn more during your research for your book, Phil? Yeah, so Professor Gill, I mean, uh, uh, as I sort of hinted at before, um, was a student of Arthur Hawley Compton, a cosmic ray physicist, actually of quite um, uh, of repute. And uh, uh, his, I mean, he, his work was recognized uh, early on. He moved back to India from Chicago to work at TIFR. Um, and to cut a long story short, he left TIFR um, after a, a sort of a, a well, a disagreement with Homi Jangir Baba. And he moved to Aligarh Muslim University. 
and uh, he uh, set up a set up a um, well he was at the department of uh, uh, of physics and set up a small nuclear experimental nuclear physics facility there etc um he was he was an interesting figure i mean an interesting figure again um and one doesn't know how his career would have panned out had he stayed on at tifr because through tifr he had access to cosmic ray research facilities in jammu um and elsewhere um as well uh whereas after that of course his access to resources was considerably reduced given you know as we said regional universities in india don't have uh, the kind of resources that institutions of national importance do tend to have um but he he is i mean i, I met his daughter once in atlanta when i was studying uh and she gave me a, a book of his but not other papers so i i i mean i i know his self narrative but i don't really know other than the tifr archives uh what else is there to see i mean i haven't followed his career that closely but he's 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 an interesting figure if for those who might be interesting uh, sorry those who might be uh, interested in looking him up uh follow quick question uh from bankers shrinivasan um thanks for the work and talk um quick question any idea about the whereabouts of dr hans's papers now i noticed there's a website with a range of photographs and publications uh i think i mean the person to ask would be uh, vikram hans who's in the audience uh, it's uh, professor hans's son uh, who yeah. might know where the papers are i i mean i have uh, i have the publications i have um, things like reports and some photographs but i don't have his personal papers and i don't think they are in an archive as far as i'm aware uh, mr vikram would you like to uh, tell us if if uh, you have any more information <laughs> Uh, yes, you can sir. unmute yourself and talk yeah can you hear me yes yes we can hear you go ahead sir thank you hello. for joining us today yeah hello everybody i have never met uh, janvi and uh, but we have been speaking on the phone many times and uh, i put up a website called hshunts.com so on this website you would find uh, most of the publications uh, i think all of them if uh, i can say that uh they have been uh, put up there as a pdf and you can they in they are there in a chronological order in fact one of the publications uh, got accepted in a journal after he passed away so i put that also on the website and uh, the pictures are there and uh, we've had uh, two three memorial uh, events in the department of physics uh, punjab university and i have put up all those events and uh, whatever i could put together in fact um, can i be can i take another minute sure sure sir go ahead yeah i've always been fond of uh, physics and i was very good at physics and mathematics but i ended up being an engineer and uh, i heard all the comments and i heard all the observations i think you guys are wonderful <laughs> <laughs> thank you I, so much uh, i love physics a lot and today i've got emotional about it yeah like you say thank thank, thank thanks thank janvi for doing this this is a great effort yeah thank, thank you thank, thank you thank you mr hans thank you this is a question from uh, barka kumari there was a mention in the film several times of the cyclotron being an accomplish for in quotes north india was this a sentiment that was felt strongly by professors and students there um and why did they feel this divide <laughs> yeah no i don't think it's a divide i mean you know like i said you know a uh, while ago uh, karnataka is the size of france and maharashtra is the size of size of germany and then extrapolate that for the rest of india so you know north of india is not a small area uh, to have uh, one particular facility right and to to be, to make that available for researchers to use in north india was uh, was was an important accomplishment and i i don't i don't think it was so much of a divide but there is no doubt that there is regionalism in play right so in my archival research for example already in the 40s and 50s you have uh, for example <laughs> recruitment papers of the indian institute of science um uh, where you know uh, uh, people in delhi are writing to people in in bangalore saying uh, you need to be careful there are too many bengali applicants this time again right so so there's regionalism at play i mean there's regionalism at play and i think uh, you know i think uh, professor hans mentioned it once uh, you know uh, in his words uh, 
uh, people thought North Indians were fools. Uh, and I, I, I mean, I don't think he quite meant it that strongly, but I think what he meant was that, you know, uh, it was in, in a way acceptable or anticipated that Bengal would, or Calcutta would get a cyclotron, right? Or Calcutta would get a particle accelerator. And Southern India with the Indian Institute of Science being India's oldest research institution was again, in a way expected and, and um, you know, to, to produce uh, good facilities and good research. But that patch of North India, which before independence was in fact extremely alive, right? Like, so the traffic between Lahore, Delhi, Allahabad, Calcutta, and Dhaka. So if you map the students and the equipment and the research that flowed between these places, right? Like, so if you look at people like uh, PK Kichlu, uh, Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar, uh, SN Post, Meghnath Saha, uh, uh, the, the guys who built the first wireless lab, uh, Toshniwal, um, uh, Dalit Singh Kothari. So they're all traveling between these three labs, right? Like Meghnath Saha is trained in Calcutta, but works in Allahabad. His students are trained in Allahabad, but go to Lahore. There are people who are trained in Lahore, but go work in Dhaka. So that traffic by the 1950s had stopped. I mean, for obvious reasons, following independence and partition. And that had led to a certain vacuum in that region for the kind of facilities and the kind of eminence in science that was seen before. And so I think that probably, to my mind, informed the sense of reclaiming to some extent the vibrancy or not, no, well, I think vibrancy is, 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 is exaggerated, capability, capability for research in the North. Um, thank you, Janvi. Uh, Satyajit Mayer, would you like to ask your question? Uh, sure. Um... Yeah, uh, Janvi, you know, um, and Shiraz, I mean, Janvi, fantastic film, really um, wonderful to see. And, you know, I, um, I had sort of typed in a, qu a question, so I'm going to just read what I wrote. And I said, you know, um, Dr. Hans's achievement was no mean feat, considering even today, it's unbelievable that something at this scale may be imagined outside the elite research centers in India today. Yes. But, but, he, but then the feat was remarkable. And I must say, your film brings it to light so beautifully and eloquently. It was, um, it was really heartwarming and uh, um, congratulations. Um, doing, no, I just, so I, but, I, but I think it raises a number of questions and I just wanted to ask at least one of them. Uh, I mean, today doing experimental science with the most cutting edge instrumentation mm -hmm. remains a challenge regardless of what anybody else may say. I mean, I'll speak <laughs> from experience. Um, and, uh, and, you know, given today's circumstances and the situation facing science and its support in the country today, uh, do you think we need to reinvent our approach to doing science to make it more uh, inward looking, make it more sort of locally kind of uh, inspired? Uh, unlike the international aspirations that, you know, Hans and his Dr. Hans and his colleagues had at that time. I mean, should we be thinking of a new trajectory for science? I mean, right now, I mean, I'm saying this seriously because I think we may need to start thinking about this. Uh, I'm saying this also because of, you know, I mean, if you look at say, you know, what's, uh, you know, the kind of you know, extraordinary science that happens say in, in countries that are beginning to close up. I mean, we in some ways uh, as a country are looking much more inward today. Um, and in fact, are worried about looking outward. So, so I think, I mean, where is the time that the, the film that you made about, was about looking at the world uh, uh, new? And mm -hmm. here, you know, I'm just wondering whether we should be thinking of something else today. I mean, the question is both to you and to Shiraz. Shiraz, do you want to take a first stab at this so I'll get a moment to think? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, the, 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 your question, if I understood right, was should we should we try to be more locally self sufficient in our science rather than uh, in, be a little more inward inward connected rather than orient our science as much as we do towards the outside? Is that is that the question? Well, I mean that that, that is part of the question. I mean, but it's also it's also about the the, the philosophy of doing science. Right? I mean, yeah. science for all of us is is necessarily a connected science of uh, but but in some ways i think you know there seems to be a deep suspicion of that right now so i'm just thinking whether we as scientists in this country need to be thinking 
thinking somewhat differently to, to reinvent the way we do science. So it sounds like a very, uh, I mean, a question I would need, I, pers I personally would need to think about. My, uh, my, 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 I'll give, just give you my gut reaction. My gut reaction is, uh, um, of course, you know, we should take inspirations from our, inspiration from our, our surroundings and inspiration from questions that are important to us and so on. But I, my gut reaction is that it's dangerous to try to close ourselves in any way. And, uh, you know, if, if there's any element of that entering this new way of doing science, I would be suspicious of it. Um, hmm. Perhaps it's not answering your question. No, no, I mean, I, I know I, I, I completely agree with you, but I'm, I'm just wondering whether we need to think this through uh, and I, see I, how, yeah. Yeah, yeah I would, I, I, think, I think it's a great question and one that requires serious thought. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. Yes, I think, I mean, I, I think, Jitu, this is, this is a tough, tough, tough question. And I think uh, people like yourselves, but also uh, Vijay Raghavan and others uh, have been, ha are posing this question again and again to all of us uh, and, you know, uh, seeking answers and, and you know, um, uh, providing answers as well. My, my two pennies, I mean, before, uh, before I kind of, you know, offer a distillation of my thoughts on what, what a new trajectory of any kind might look like, I think in the very first instance, what we need to do, and this is something again, people like yourselves and Radham Narsima have been saying for a while, is that I think we need to invest locally much more. I don't know about aspiration so much, but investing locally. And what I mean by that is universities. You know, uh, you know, Madras University more or less has given this country uh, two Nobel laureates, which is uh, Chandrasekhar Venkataraman and Subramaniam Chandrasekhar. And in any university, I mean, not that again, you know, we are looking to the West for benchmarks, but any other university in the West, which would have given a country its two Nobel laureates, especially when there are so few Nobel laureates to count at all, uh, would have received investment of the kind that would be unprecedented. Madras University doesn't get any kind of investment of that kind, right? So I think investing in our universities is primary because even at institutions of national importance if you want good students to show up if you want creativity to show up you want to invest in universities you want good teachers there i think we have failed our regional universities so badly for so long that i think that would be i mean if we are looking for the building blocks to a new trajectory that would be the first brick i would want to lay but even before I lay the fir that first brick, I think alongside that and tightly bound to that, I would want us to see the same kind of investment in the ITIs as they, there is in the IITs, the industrial training institutes and the Indian institutes of technology. We cannot build an industrialized scientific econ knowledge economy without equal investment and without prestige for handwork and respect for handwork and training for handwork, be it for use in the laboratory, be it for use in industry, I think we just simply need to do that. So universities, ITIs like IITs, industrial research. I mean, you know, we all talk about, you know, wonderful stories from Bell Laboratories, from HP. So many of them, right? I mean, the, the one, one could, I mean, you know, there have been, there are brilliant histories of industrial research elsewhere. Why is it that industrial research in India falters so badly, right? And I think that industrial research needs to be also supported, um, supported strongly, strongly, strongly. So that would be probably among the next, next things I would look at. And I, I agree with Shiraz that, you know, and, I, and I, I'm pretty sure you, you, you would, you know, you, you wouldn't disagree to that at all, because this wouldn't mean closing in. There are research labs, you know, already of various international industries and now I'm guessing also of universities that will start showing up in India, right? So one could collaborate with them. I don't think collaboration is a problem, but getting our own students, our own technicians trained properly, letting them be the focus of our effort would be, would be extremely important. And again, you know, good questions can arise from anywhere and good scientific questions can be relevant to our context. I mean, you know, there's a reason why Tropical diseases are simply not as well researched as elsewhere, and you know, I mean, and 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 people at you know NCBS and and increasingly at and, and CMC and others are now redressing that. But again, scale, right? I think uh, we are only beginning to get there with the increased number of IITs, with the increased number of ICERs, etc. So, good. I mean, new institutions will come, new um, 
new good questions will come. Uh, there, of course, has to be some degree of freedom. I mean, you know, the, in the Soviet Union, as well as during the, during the Third Reich, they tried to distinguish between scientific freedom and political freedom, saying political freedom wasn't necessary. Scientific freedom was okay to be given. And, you know, you keep your scientists in luxury and they'll be fine and they'll produce good work. Uh, it works up to a point. They did get Sputnik before the Americans did, uh, but then it begins to collapse. So I think in the long run, um, state intervention can play a, play a good role only up to a certain point, I think. But, but that doesn't mean it has to recede or decline. And I think the United States is a big example of this. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a 20th century superpower that rose just like the Soviet Union by significant investment alongside, of course, industrial research, but state investment in laboratories. I mean, the kind of money that flowed into American labs following the Second World War was, I mean, unprecedented, unprecedented. And including through contract research and all, which, which of course, I mean, you're aware of, and probably the younger people in the audience might not be aware of. But state support for education, state support for research, state support for health and agriculture, I think are simply non-negotiables or should be non-negotiables because that is, you know, in many ways, what is going to hold up this research and hold up good education. And I think, I mean, the international recognition will follow right? It will follow. It will come. I mean, instead of servicing an agenda set in a journal or in, a, in, a, in, a, in the annual conference of a field, uh, setting agendas, you know, from here or ideas from India, as you know, uh, tritely put, uh, would, would, be, would be a valuable direction to travel, right? Like where in many ways we produce ideas or we produce research frontiers that, you know, become um, become attractive, for lack of a better word. Yeah. Did I ramble? Yes, I did ramble. No. Thank you. No, I mean, I, yeah. I, I, think, yeah, I think you both are saying things, you know, you know, I, mean, I was just trying to look at point, counterpoint, you know, I mean, we are 75 years, yeah. you know, from the time that the, that the cyclotron was assembled in Punjab, right? And and I and I think it's you know it's it's important that I mean what you say if that if what you say holds out there is a huge um, opportunity ahead, but if we begin to shut things up, right? Yeah. And that's that's the worry I'm saying. You know, do we need to think about that? And if we do, then what should it be? That's yeah. I mean that, that that's all I, you know. I mean I, I, I maybe we shouldn't take this any further. Yeah, I think. I mean, like Shiraz uh, said, uh... <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, Jitu, unequivocally, no. I mean, closing is not an option. I think uh, it should not be an option because historically we've seen any, any. Uh, I mean, we, we cannot separate scientific freedom from political freedom. So I think uh, closing in is not an option. But how to strengthen things internally, I think, I mean, there are. There, I'm sure there are people who have much better answers than I do, but I do think universities, ITIs, industrial research, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Satyajit. Uh, this is a good note to conclude this discussion. Um, for those of you who haven't seen the film, you can watch the film for another week uh, until uh, the 4th of October. Uh, and coming back to the film, it's finally a human story, the story of Hans and Goel and the role in making the cyclotron possible shows the importance of recording the history of science. And for that, thank you, Janvi. And thank you, Shiraz, for being a part of this discussion. And thank you, audiences, for joining us on a Sunday evening. Thank you very much, Raghu. Thank you again, Shiraz. Uh, it was wonderful. And thank you for premiering my film. It was our pleasure. <laughs>